The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Here now the reading of God's Word as it is found in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning in verse 15. Therefore, He is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. And in the same way, he sprinkled with blood the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all. At the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment... So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. We're well on our way in the study of the book of Hebrews, and Hebrews rejoices in Jesus as the Son of God who gave himself for us. And so the themes that he deals with, he covers again and again and again in slightly different ways. Well, last week we saw the blood of Christ obtains eternal redemption. But this week he asks the question, why did God's son have to die? Why why was this necessary? And let's ask, God's grace to pull back the veil and show us the glory of Jesus as we look at this passage. Our Father, we thank you that you have sent not only a list of rules that we're to keep, you didn't even just send us a message, but Lord, you sent us your son, Jesus, to die on our behalf. And Father, we pray that you would show us both ourselves and our deep need But Lord, we pray that you would answer that need by showing us Jesus and the fullness that he gives. So Lord, we ask that you would show us his face in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a phrase we use in Christianity all the time. The New Testament and the Old Testament. And we use it so often that we really need to ask, What does it mean? Why do we use the word New Testament? What are we talking about? And should we call this Bible that we hold in our hands, should we call this a testament? You know, we call it the the Bible, we call it the Word of God, but should it be called a testament? Is it? And what is a testament? Well, we're going to deal with all those questions and I'm not going to answer them right now. I'm going to spend the rest of the sermon doing it. But just a hint of where we're going. The new covenant could not 
help us apart from the death of Jesus. But with the death of Jesus, the new covenant is established once and for all. Well, there is an old book dealing with this question. Why did Jesus die? And it was written by a monk in the 1100s named Anselm. And his book is titled, Cor Deus Homo. Why did God become man? Well, you could ask another question that this passage raises. Cor Deus Mortus. Why did God die? What's going on? Well, if you were paying attention last week, Pastor George could not contain himself with his reading. So we were reading through the bulletin, and he read, and then I was finished. And I looked up, and he said, Therefore, he is the mediator of the new covenant. This is the word of the Lord. (laughs) And I looked at my bulletin a second time and thought, Well, that's true, and it is in the Bible, but that's not here. (laughs) But Pastor George took the conclusion of his passage, which is the conclusion that Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant because he shed his blood. Because it is the blood of the Christ offered through the eternal spirit presented to the living God, Jesus has the right to become the mediator of a new covenant. So Pastor George was absolutely right to bring in the reading last week. But why? Why Was this necessary? Why did the Son of God die? Why didn't we get to copy the story of Abraham from the Old Testament? Do you remember? God, after blessing Abraham, he promised him, I'm going to give you this child. And after years of waiting, they finally had a child, and he was 100 years old. I can't imagine dealing with a newborn as a 100-year-old. But Abraham finally got what he was promised, And then as he was growing up, God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son and kill him. And I'm going to send you to this mountain and you go. And Abraham, we don't really get much from the story. All we hear Abraham saying is, here I am. And he obeys everything God tells him. So he took his son and a knife and wood for a sacrifice. And when he went up to Mount Moriah, he took the knife in his hand. And God waited until the knife was ready to strike his son to kill him. And God said, stop, stop. I'm not looking for a human sacrifice. I'm not like all the other gods of the nations around you. I see that you fear God, but look, there is a ram caught in the thicket in the thorns. Take that ram and you can sacrifice the ram instead. And it's a beautiful ending of the story. Why couldn't that happen with Jesus? He goes to the cross, he's willing to sacrifice himself, he's there to die, and God said, no, 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 stop, stop. Do not kill the Son of God, here is a ram instead. Why couldn't we have that ending in the Gospels? Well, verse 15 tells us what all of this was for. The goal of the new covenant is that everyone who is called will receive the promised eternal inheritance. That's what this is working towards. The inheritance must not be lost because God promised everyone who believes you will have this inheritance. And the inheritance is kept in heaven for you while you are being kept on earth for this inheritance. God is giving you everything you need. Well, the writer of Hebrews says this can only happen in the event of a death. And he even shows this in the structure of his sentence in the Greek. It's awkward. They cleaned it up in the English so that it makes sense. But in the Greek, it reads this way. He is the mediator of a new covenant since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgressions committed under the first covenant so that the called ones might receive the promise. So the way he writes the sentence, you have to go through death before you can get to the inheritance. God has promised an inheritance from the beginning of the Bible. From the time Adam first sinned, God said, here's your inheritance, Adam. You're going to have a seed that will crush the head of the serpent. And ever since 
Adam sinned, we have had something blocking our way to this inheritance. We have this word that we use in church, transgression. And transgression means to step over a line. And so we all know what that's like if you have kids or if you are a kid. And someone draws a line on the ground and says, now listen, I want you to stay here in this room and here's a line. Don't step over the line. And as we all know, kids never step over the line after you tell them not to, right? No. God drew ten lines in the Ten Commandments. So let me explain to you how to obey me. There's a line right here on the ground. Don't step over this one. And here's a second line. And here's a third. And here We have ten lines given to us on the ground. And what do we do? God says... Thou shalt not. Don't step over the line. And we all say, oh, but I will. And we do it again and again and again. And because of that, none of us is eligible to receive the covenant. None of us. Because the wages of sin, the just penalty of sin, stepping over that line that God commanded not to, is death. So blood is necessary. And we see that all the way through the the system of sacrifices in the book of Leviticus. It's because there is transgression. What do we see from all the sacrifices of the Old Testament? The only way out of transgression is through death. That's the only way out. And when Jesus brings a new covenant, how does he do it? Well, in verse 16, it says, where a will is involved, and I want you to stop there. We've been talking about covenant, all of Hebrews. And now he says, but where a will is involved, who said anything about a will? We're We're not talking about a will. We're talking about a covenant. Well, in Greek, it's a little bit more complicated, but easier because the word is the same word. So in the Greek, it says this. A death redeems them from transgressions under the first covenant for where a covenant is involved. It's the same word. Um, But the word has two different meanings. It can be a will and testament, or it can be a covenant. And by the way, this is where we use the phrase, the New Testament. It's from this passage. Now, the apostle is drawing on the nature of a will or a testament to show why God must die. God has written a will for us. We have this last will and testament of God. And when he writes this will, he calls us to this eternal inheritance. And I can't imagine what the inheritance will be if God is the one leaving you his inheritance. All of God's lands, all of God's treasures, all of God's possessions are being left to you in this inheritance. And Christ has acted as the one who wrote this last will and testament. And verse 17 tells us this, But a will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who makes it is alive. So if I write a will and give everything to my children, everything I have is theirs by inheritance. But that doesn't mean that my kids get to keep the keys of our house. Or that my seven-year-old can say, Dad, I'm going to take the car. I noticed in the will that it's mine, so I'll see you later. Thanks for the keys. They don't get any of of those things until I die. That's how a will works. And then you get the inheritance. Well, when God cut a covenant with us, he promised to save us, he wrote it out in the same way that we write out a will. And God, the Son, had to die in order for it to take effect. Now, everyone who is effectually called by God will receive the promised inheritance. God is faithful. It's going to happen. And the new covenant works the same way that a will and a testament work. God himself had to die to give us his inheritance. And so we call this book the New Testament. It's the will of God. 
Now, so he pulls from, from the Greek language, which merges covenant and will. But a lot of theologians say, that's, you can't do that. That's a foul. I'm calling a foul on, on, on the field. You, you can't just pick a word and say, well, it has this other meaning. So then the author of Hebrews deals with that objection and says, let's look at the Old Testament and see if it's similar. How did it work? And his argument is even the Old Testament was ratified by death. Now, when God made a covenant with Israel, God never died in the Old Testament in order to bring this covenant. So it doesn't look as much like a testament in the Old Covenant. But this is what the argument is. Even in the Old Covenant, it was never ratified without blood. There was blood even then. And he quotes from Exodus chapter 24. I'm going to give you just a little bit of the context so you know what's going on. God had delivered his people from Egypt. And he said, I'm going to come meet with you on this mountain, but don't go near it. I'm actually not going to meet with the people. I'm just going to meet with their representative, Moses. If the people touch the mountain, they'll die. And they could see it. There was an earthquake happening on the mountain because God was coming down. There was smoke. It said it was like a furnace. There's smoke coming out of the mountain because God is there. And when Moses went to meet with God, God began to speak to him. Exodus chapter 20, what did God say? Ten Commandments. So he was speaking to Moses, the Ten Commandments, but it keeps going for actually four chapters of commands. And at the end of that, Moses came back to the people to tell them what God had to say, give them the Ten Commandments. And after Moses read the Ten Commandments and four more chapters of commands, this is what Israel said. All the words which the Lord has said, we will do. And Israel at that time would have been about two million people. They're all shouting in response, we will obey God. And Moses, how did he respond? Well, he got up early the next morning and built an altar and said, all right, young men, I want you to go kill a lot of animals. And when he came back, he read them the book of the covenant a second time with all of its laws. And the whole nation answered again. Could you imagine being there with two million people watching Moses, reading the law? And here's your response. All that the Lord has said, we will do and be obedient. We're going to obey everything that God said. And I think, man, I would love to be part of that nation (laughs) that obeys everything that God says. And can you imagine the excitement of the zeal of the people, their resolve to obey God? And then Moses did something strange in response. He congratulated them by taking blood and throwing it on all of them. And this is what he was saying. You think you will obey God. You think you will perfectly obey. You need to be covered with blood. Could you imagine being sprinkled with some of the blood after saying, I'm going to do everything God said, and you're spattered with blood. What do we do? As you read the Bible, there are lots of commands of God. You should obey every one of them. That's the call of Scripture. And as soon as you resolve to do everything God commands you, this is what you need. You need to be sprinkled with blood. Because even the old covenant testified there must be death. It does not matter how zealous you are in your desire and your commitment to obey God. You you can actually take vows. You could come this morning and say, I want to stand here and pledge in front of the whole congregation. I promise to obey everything God said. And at the end of that, God knows your heart. And God says, you must be sprinkled with blood. Otherwise, God's covenant will be a closed book to you. It's not for you. Moses sprinkled even more than just the people. By the way, it's only a couple times ever in the Bible that someone is sprinkled with blood. And that's one of the key ones. But Moses didn't just sprinkle the people. He sprinkled the tabernacle, which is a tent. Moses said, you know, this tent, God's glory will be here. We need to cover all of this with blood. And he went out with his zeal and he covered the altar where they were going to make sacrifices. He covered that with blood. 
and sacrificed for seven days and brought blood even to the altar before they could start sacrificing on it. Um, everything in this old covenant was purified with blood. Now, why was there so much blood in the old covenant? There were sacrifices every day, and the priest's job, he was a butcher. He was bloody all of the time. Why was there so much blood in the Old Testament? Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. The wages of sin is death. There is no forgiveness without blood. And so all those sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were not meaningless or arbitrary. And other, other nations would offer sacrifices and said, you know, if we feed our gods and I will give them the best cut of steak. He can have this best cut of steak, and once our God has been fed and he's no longer hungry, then we can start making deals with him because, you know, we just gave him the best steak. So he can give us something in return. That's not what the sacrifices were for God. Sacrifices never enrich God. And when we give our money in a tithe box or in an alms box, God is not that much richer after you put your check in. God does not need anything that we have. He owns it all. All the sacrifices in the Old Testament were preaching this. You cannot be forgiven without blood. They were all preaching the same sermon. Blood is necessary. Someone has to die in order to give you this inheritance. Now Jesus brings a better sacrifice in order to fully pay for the forgiveness of our sins. And so this better sacrifice is offered once for all. So that's what we have, verses 23 to 28. This new covenant is sealed with richer blood than the blood of an animal. In the old covenant, they brought sacrifice to purify these copies of the heavenly things. Um, So the tabernacle and all of its worship, they were only pencil sketches. There's this, and and then it looks like this holy place, and then I want these lamps here, and I want a veil here. They're just pencil sketches. And those pencil sketches were purified with the blood of animals. That's how it worked in the Old Testament. But the real throne of God, not just the mercy seat with their copy, the real throne of God must be purified with something better than animal blood in order for God to meet with sinners. No animal can cleanse God's throne and deliver us from defilement to come to the Holy One. We need a better sacrifice. And so we have in verse 24, Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true. Did you catch that phrase? Handmade holies. What is this tent over there? Oh, this is our holies. It looks kind of handmade. (laughs) Yeah, it's a handmade holy. The old covenant, those priests served in the handmade replicas. But the real holies are not handmade. They're God-made. And Christ has entered the real holies, and he appears before the face of God, bringing the effects of his sacrifice for us. And this is the gospel. This is what Christianity is all about. Jesus returned to heaven to share the glory of God with us. He is in God's presence today. Jesus is with his Father on your behalf. That's what he's doing. He is ruling over all things on the throne of heaven for your good. Jesus is ordering everything to build you up. So don't miss the glory of that one little phrase, for us, on our behalf. That's the hope of Jesus. The everlasting Son returned to the everlasting Father to benefit you. That's what we have in Christianity. Christ brings this better sacrifice into a better place. And it meets all of our needs in verse 25. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. The high priest, he went in on the day of atonement 
And actually, the Jews still mark their calendars every year with the celebration of this day, Yom Kippur. It's the Day of Atonement. And this, the priest would go in and he would make atonement for your sins. And it was glorious. Your sins were forgiven until next year. But you had sinned again. And so what do we do? Oh, we need another Day of Atonement. That's great. All my sins are dealt with. Weren't they dealt with last year? Well, yeah, but you sinned again. So we need it. So we're going to need this, you know, forever, the Day of Atonement. Well, Jesus did not come to offer himself copying them in that way. Because if he did, Jesus would have to suffer every day that someone sinned. Can you imagine? All right. and, and it says here, from the foundation of the world. So Adam sinned. And what would have to happen? Jesus would have to die the day Adam sinned. And then what happens in the next page of scripture? Cain murdered his brother Abel. Is there any hope for Cain? Jesus will have to come die again for Cain. Noah and the whole world abandoning God. How could Noah be saved at the ark? Jesus would have to die for Noah again. And then you could just keep going through the line. Abraham who worships idols. Jesus would have had to die that day when Abraham was worshiping idols. Jesus would have to die the day that Joseph's brothers sold him into slavery. You can go through all the Bible and say, if we're going to follow that pattern, every time there's a sin, there has to be a sacrifice, Jesus would have had to die constantly. And that doesn't stop in Bible times. Could you imagine if every time you sin this next week, this is what you have to do. Come to the church, confess your sin, and Jesus will have to die for you again. Can you imagine? Every day that you sinned, Jesus would have to die. That's what was required in the Old Testament. But now, at the end of the ages, Christ appeared. He came. There's something different. In the Old Testament, God had promised Jesus. He had drawn pictures of him. He sent people that were like him in certain ways. He... God promised Jesus as a serpent-crushing seed. God pictured Jesus as an ark saving you from a flood. God represented Jesus by cutting animals in two and killing them to make a covenant. God prefigured Jesus by Joseph suffering at the hand of his brothers. I mean, you have everywhere all these things about Jesus. But no longer is Christ just a promise. Christ appeared. He came. He's here. Christ abolished sins by his death. And that word abolished, there's one translation that says Jesus destroyed sins. I love that phrase. Jesus sacrificed himself once for all. And that's it. It's finished. What was never done in the Old Testament, it's finished. One sacrifice for all time. Never before was such a sacrifice given. Never after will such a sacrifice be required. It's finished. Once and for all. And then he argues from the way that we die. Jesus' death parallels our death, which is once. Verse 27, just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Every child of Adam has an appointment. We have a court date with our maker. And after our death is the judgment. And if you haven't realized that before now, you have now been served your papers. (laughs) We're going to die and go before the presence of God. But humans only die once. Jesus, his sacrifice parallels that. He is offered once to bear the sins of of many. There is no continual sacrifice. There's no ongoing crucifix. Um, there's a great novel called Bride's Head Revisited, written by Evelyn Waugh. And at the end, there's a, one person who grew up Roman Catholic. She's not really living in the faith. She's living in sin, and she's horrified. And this is how she describes her sin being dealt with at the end. Christ dying with it. Nailed hand and foot hanging over the bed in the night nursery. Hanging year after year in the dark little study at Farm Street with 
the shining oil cloth, hanging in the dark church where only the old charwoman raises the dust and one candle burns, hanging at noon high among the crowds and the soldiers, no comfort except a sponge of vinegar, the kind words of a thief, hanging forever. Never the cool sepulcher and the grave clothes spread on the stone slab, never the oil and the spices, always the midday sun and the dice clicking for the seamless coat. That's what it would have been if Jesus had to continually suffer for us. But Jesus died once for all. There is no crucifix. It's finished. For us, there is one death leading to judgment for Christ. There is one offering leading to salvation. He bore the sins of many. And there will be such a gathering of believers when Christ returns for those who are waiting for him that Jesus will look on the anguish of the cross and be satisfied. And he will say, it was all worth it. Jesus, who died, will be satisfied, and heaven and earth be one. That's the reason we call it the New Testament. Because everything written in this book is given to you when the Son of God died. This book is not just a list of commands. Here's how you should live and be a good person. This book is not just a description of how to be good. It's not even just good news for you to believe. This book is our inheritance, bought for us with the blood of the eternal covenant. So this week, you need to receive everything you need from this inheritance. And it was bought for you with the blood of the eternal covenant. So live with all the privileges of being a New Testament Christian. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.